Greetings. Welcome to the Ontic Protective Intelligence Podcast. I'm Chuck Randolph, Ontic's Chief Security Officer. From 30 years as a military officer and 20 transforming corporate security teams to function beyond their traditional roles, protection, risk management, and threat mitigation have been front and center throughout my career. This podcast series will explore the turbulent world of risk, security, and protective strategies through conversations with leaders and innovators in the field. Now, on to the conversation. Major General Richard Lake works as an independent consultant focusing on global and corporate security issues. Prior to his retirement from active duty in 2013, Lake served over 36 years in the U.S. Marine Corps as an intelligence, foreign area, and infantry officer. As a general officer in the Marine Corps, he led one of the U.S. intelligence community's elements as the director of intelligence for the U.S. Marine Corps for four years. He subsequently served for four more years with the CIA as one of the deputy directors for community human intelligence for the National Clandestine Service, which is now called the Directorate of Operations. During his service, he received a variety of U.S. and foreign military decorations to include the Secretary of Navy's Distinguished Service Medal, the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, the CIA's Distinguished Intelligence Medal, the National Clandestine Service Donovan Award, and the Defense Intelligence Director's Award. After his retirement, Major General Lake entered the private sector and worked as the Chief Security Officer of Booz Allen Hamilton and the Director of Global Security for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Major General Dick Lake, welcome to Ontic's Protective Intelligence Podcast. Thanks, Chuck. And please, as always, call me Dick. I'm an old retired guy now. Well, but I, I know, but I had to get that in in the very beginning. You know that. Yeah. Right. Uh, but now that that's out of the way with, uh, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to have you on the podcast, Dick, because I've known you for a long time and, you know, I've you know, I've been pretty clear with folks. I've considered you somewhat of a mentor throughout the years who have given me some guidance. So I think it's great. And I appreciate that your first foray into the podcast world <laughs> is with with me and with Ontic. So again, I, I appreciate your time here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I know a lot about your background, but I'm one thing I've always been curious to, to ask you is, you know, regarding your career, you know, what made a young Master Lake decide to have a career that really was about service, you know, service to country and duty that then transferred itself to, you know, the the organizational and corporate world of risk? Yeah, the uh, I would I think you kind of touched on it. I think one of the things that summed up things is I've always been very focused on the concept of duty, duty to my my family, duty to my friends, duty to my organizations, duty to my country. And uh, that's kind of one of my touchstones is being so focused on duty and trying to make a difference. In an, and of course, all of us want to try to make a difference in our lives. And the challenge is finding an area where we have an interest and we have a talent. And I was uh, fortunate enough to identify after thinking about it several times, the best place for me to do that was in the military and in the Marine Corps specifically. And mm -hmm. a lot in terms of what I've did in my Marine Corps career was try to make a difference to make people's lives better, both the people that I work with, the, the missions I tried to accomplish. And uh, it didn't hurt that as part of this, I also had a real strong dislike for bullies who tried to take advantage of people who were weaker or less defense, well defended than others. So you were always at, you were always a protector at heart then, I guess. That's what I like to think. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I realize like every, you know, being a Marine, everyone's a warrior, but at, you know, in the core, you found yourself in the intelligence field. And was there anything about it that, you know, back at that time when decisions were made, like, look, I could be in the infantry or I could be in logistics or intelligence or, or maybe an aviator. What was it about intelligence that maybe was interesting or drew you to it? Sure. You know, I started out and spent my first six years in the infantry. When, But when I did that at the very beginning, I was very torn between the infantry and intelligence. And after serving in the infantry and reconnaissance units, I decided and looked and compared what I might do 
in the infantry versus what I might do in the intelligence field. And I thought that the intelligence field was a better fit for me. And it was an area I thought I could contribute more uh, to the organization. Well, that's interesting because if you, I was a scout as well. And I see when you say that, because a lot of what scouting, you know, at least in the army side of things was going forward, gathering information, data, helping commanders, uh, as they're running a battle, make, uh, data, you know, what we would call now, like, uh, data enabled decisions. So, I mean, it, it's, it makes perfect sense to me that, you know, a young Marine would say, Hey, I'm look, I'm doing infantry things and I'm, I'm in scouting, I'm in recon. And now to take that and say, let's take that to the next level and be on the side that's a net that's doing the analysis of the data that we get. Right. And as a Marine commandant years ago, who was a Medal of Honor recipient from the Battle of Terror in World War II, I thought summed it up pretty well, where he said, to lack intelligence is to be in the ring blindfolded. And that kind of yeah. always st stayed with me and, you know, and struck me. And so I like to give a, the decision advantage to the decision maker so we can ac better accomplish our mission at a lower cost. Yeah, I love that too, especially that statement of decision advantage. And I, you know, I think about, you know, maybe when, you know, a lot of what we've done in the military, a lot of what folks in the military can translate things over to the business world. And you consider back in the days when, you know, intelligence reports were handed down to people in the operations level. Like here is the report, you go read it, it's got the weather and everything else. But now we're at a point where there's everyone's uh, everyone's generating telemetry of some sense. And I remember you and I were at an OSAC meeting once and I was running a panel that you were kind enough to sit on. And we were talking about, about big data and you said big data is an analyst problem. Um, and that stuck with me. And, you know, this was probably seven, eight years ago. And we've continued to have this problem of big data being being the analyst problem. I mean, how have you seen the intelligence world and the idea of data and analysis progress over your your career and tenure in it? Well, one of the things I would point out is, you know, that you've heard the saying that uh, logistics is too important to be left to logistics people. Uh, <laughs> finance is too important to be left to finance people. I would say the same goes for intelligence. When it comes to do, and doing intelligence, it, which I think is one of the fundamental basics, underpinnings of doing security work, uh, this needs to be a team sport with everybody involved from the CEO on down. Uh, because what I've enjoyed about my later portion of my career is you went from having you know, senior officials who had little knowledge of intelligence or security to having a very in-depth experience, and you could actually have very intelligent conversations with them about the pros and cons. And so when you get, you know, particularly in the corporate world, when you get the CEO and the executive leadership team behind what you're doing, it's uh, pretty hard to stop. If you don't have your executive leadership team as discerning, informed, and supportive customers, you got a tough row to hoe. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I think about like some tenets of intelligence. One of them is understanding what the priority intelligence requirements are, sometimes known as PIR. And I think, you know, from like some more like a, say military or government organizations, those things are handed. Here's, here's, what sac here's what's sacrosanct that we need to follow. Oftentimes in a world of, say, like .com or .org or other organizations, it's not so easily discerned as to what the, the intelligence requirements might be. I mean, how, how did you translate and how would you recommend people translating the ability to say, hey, here's some tenets that we have from, say, being in the military or in the government world now into the, the private or the corporate world? I would push back just a little on you, Chuck, when you said you kind of have it handed to you in the military. That's not always the case. And so what I had to do in the military is similar to what I had to do in the corporate world is sell my product, convince mm -hmm. people that I had a product that was worth using and why it was in their self-interest and to their benefit to use that product. And then the key thing is I call it, you always, whether you're a security professional, you want to have a seat at the family dinner table of the corporate leadership. 
And when I right. say about having a seat at the family dinner table, you want to be able to participate in the discussion just like a family member. You know, for example, if you have a house guest coming over for dinner and uh, they say something about uh, negative, maybe about one of your kids, it's, you know, uh, that usually doesn't go over too well. Were you and your <laughs> no. wife having that conversation? That goes over well. You can say, you know, John is a little stubborn and your wife will go, yeah, John is a little stubborn, but you know, he's got a very good heart. So you don't right. take offense when the, when your wife says something like that. Similarly, you want to be able to have those discussions with the CEO, the chief legal officer, chief of HR, and have those discussions where you can have that give and take and that trust because they recognize it's more important to have you at the dinner table able to have those frank discussions and do it in advance of need so you're not trying to sort all this out in the middle of a crisis. No, I think that's great. And, you know, we often hear like, don't lose your seat at the table. But I, I like your nuance, the family table, because you're right. It suggests a more intimate discussion and a trust, a trust value. And also, I think sometimes when you're at the family table, you're not always talking, but you're there and you have a presence. So when you do say something, pe people do listen. It's not, hey, I'm here and I need to be, I need to be talking so they know I'm here, which sometimes, you know, can lose its value over a period of time. Yeah, and I think there's a we COVID has kind of taught us a variety of ways to have a seat at the family dinner table in a bit of a non-traditional way, whether it be via video teleconferences, Skype, uh, you know, things that are there. Because as I like to say to people, and I know I'm a dinosaur looking for my tar pit, but a virtual presence is actual absence. Yes. And so if yes. So if you were at the family dinner table and it's v via Skype, you're at the family dinner table. Not quite as good at being there physically, but it's but you're still there. Yeah, and I think pres presence has power. Um, oftentimes, I think a, a problem, and I'm curious as to your comments on this statement, do we have a problem as security leaders of this, um, shall I say, this coat that we wear that says break glass in case of emergency. In other words, hey, I'm here and I'm your first responder, break the glass and I'll come out and do the needful. And then we get put back into the glass, you know, or we get put back into the uh, container and we lose that family dinner table um, metaphor that you're talking about. Do you, do you feel like in your observations that is something we're, we're overcoming or is this something that we need to focus on as security leaders? I, th I think it's something that we're increasingly overcoming, but I think it's one of those things that has to be continuously focused on. You know, when somebody wanted to try to put me inside that glass case, I had fought tooth and nail not to get shut inside that case because, uh, as I said, you want to be there at the beginning. I often tell people, if you want me there at the crash, uh, you better have me there at the takeoff. We'll get back to the conversation in just a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Ontix Center for Protective Intelligence. In the world of safety, security, and protection, we know that gathering and sharing information is crucial. That is why we created the Ontix Center for Protective Intelligence. The center is a trusted resource for those in security, safety, and protection communities. We share strategies and best practices, insights on current and historical trends, and lessons learned through dialogue, discourse, and alternative analysis from some of the industry's top practitioners. To find blogs, podcasts, webinars, white papers, and more, check out the center by visiting ontic.co slash center. That's ontic.co slash center. You know, you have a long career, you know, Marine Corps, you were the uh, director for intelligence at the Marine Corps. You spent time at the CIA as a deputy director. Uh, you were at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You uh, you spent time as a CSO uh, for multiple organizations. I mean, what went with you as you moved from military to government, from government to NGO, and from NGO to dot com? What went with me is... The, the mindfulness, my function exists to provide a service. And so I have to make myself useful to the organization. I am not the dog. I am the tail. 
But when the mm-hmm. dog wants to wag, I need to be prepared and the dog needs to be understanding of how I'm going to wag and then wag right. enthusiastically and appropriately. So uh, part of it no, is I, what's my value proposition to the organization. Yeah. And one of the key ways you establish your value is you have an in-depth understanding of the business of the business. And look for yes. look to identify ways that you can contribute a little something to the, the the business people to help them with their work. As I used to tell folks, is I'd like to give you a seven course dinner every day, but uh, I probably can't do that. But if every now and then I bring you a donut, you're probably not going to say bad things about me. <laughs> no, it's true though because I think you're right. If you're bringing the seven course dinner every day, and then it becomes the norm. So then I guess if we think about this in terms of like priorities and requirements, if if you're acting like everything is a fire drill every day, then at some point when you do walk in, you're like, we need to talk. You know, you, you might lose that that moment of uh, criticality that comes with that knock on the door and, hey, I, you and I need to have a conversation. Yeah. And to, and to me, it's all about being accepted and recognized as a part of the team. In other words, why would we not have this meeting without somebody from security here? Maybe right. they only have t- 50 cents worth of value to, to contribute. But again, it's the presence. You're there. You're part of the team. You're problem solving together. You're establishing your value proposition. Yeah, absolutely. How do you, well, I, I want to come back to the value proposition thing. You just, you made me think of something interesting, but I don't want to get off of the the transition piece without saying, great, we understand that a sense of service and duty c- has come with you a, a amongst from dot mill to, to dot gov to dot org and dot com. Was there anything that you realized, hey, I need to leave this, I need to, I need to put this in a box. I'm going to leave it here and not take it with me. Well, there's some there, there are naturally some differences that you and one of the things I'm a big believer in is is it regardless of where you are, is you need to understand the organization's culture that you're that you're part of. Mm-hmm and adjust to fit into that culture. And I'm not talking I'm not about being deceptive or manip- manipulative, but I, once I left the military, I was in a meeting one time, and I used one of the standard phrases I always used in the military, which was the military equivalent of, now tell me if I'm crazy. And I was in a, this was when, when I was in, uh, on the West Coast, I was in a meeting and I used the phrase, now tell me if I'm smoking something unauthorized. And and someone in the meeting looked at me and very sincerely said, what is unauthorized? <laughs> and, I, and I said, you yeah, know, okay, I'm in Washington State. Uh, Marijuana is legal. Uh, yeah, so I said, note to self, you know, change your terminology. And so my ter- 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 terminology went back to, now tell me if I'm crazy. And then they're like, oh. I get that. It's interesting. I was just listening to, you know, I I literally just flew in from from out of state, rushed home so I could get on and and have this conversation with you. And I was listening to a speech about uh, cultural interpretation. You know, Dick, you know, I'm an old information operations person and we have a mantra in IO, words have meaning. And I've been fascinated lately about this idea, like you just said, if you said smoking something unauthorized culturally, what does that nuance mean? So how do we get on, you know, how do we think about common operating, you know, common operating information, common operating language that gets us to common operating procedures and thinking about the barriers. So, I mean, you know, probably I don't know that everyone is as thoughtful as you are to understand like, oh, I'm making a cultural reference that's that's falling on deaf ears here. So I'm going to I'm going to change my language. Is that something that's come natural to you or is that something that you've learned throughout your career? Uh, that's something I kind of learned throughout my career. In, in addition to my service in, in the infantry and as an intelligence officer primarily, I was also a foreign area officer, which is a military construct for people who have graduate education and experience with speaking foreign languages and operating in foreign cultures. And so I had several times in my career, I was in assignments where I was operating totally in a foreign language and a foreign country and a foreign culture. You had to learn to adapt because if you know the cultural nuances were important, 
Well, just like you said, look, they're speaking, you know, if you're speaking German, I'm speaking French, someone in the audience, you know, primary is English. What are they thinking in? How do they dream? How are they conceptualizing the language or the noise that's coming in? And it, you know, the, and, and how does that affect the decision making? So, I mean, you know, that that's brilliant. And what a great experience being an FAO to bring that with you. I, I want to go back, Dick, you, you were talking about like understanding the priorities of, of the organization and something that occurred to me because you've been the leader of, of people. How do you, how have you made sure that your, your subordinates, your underlings, your lieutenants are a capable in understanding of the priorities of the organization so that they can best represent the priorities of security uh, where they are, if that makes sense. No, no, it, it does make sense. And I think it's important that as a leader in any uh, organization, you recognize the fact that we lead people and we manage resources. But when we're talking about leading people, one of the things is and I and perhaps this is a little bit of a, more of an American thing than other cultures, but I haven't found it to be misplaced in other cultures. Is when you tell people have to understand the reason why, and so you need to to act as a, what I call a linking pin between your seniors, your peers, as well as your juniors, and do do a lot of communication so that they understand. They don't necessarily have to agree with why a company or a policy is in place, but they really need to understand the reason why. I used to tell people, if the CEO asks you, why are you doing this? You know, I want you to be, I will not be upset if you say, we're doing this because Dick Lake said we're doing it because of A, B, and C. Now, I don't agree with it, but that's the reason why. I won't be upset by that. The thing that'll upset me is if the CEO asks you, why are you doing that? And you go, I don't know. I don't know. Yep. Uh, that is, well, and that and that says something about the culture, the subculture of, of the security or the business organization or business unit you're in as well. I mean, you have to empower those folks so everyone understands like, look, again, these are the decisions that made. Here's also the key themes and messages of security, be it like, you know, one badge, one entry or, you know, every right, everyone right. a sensor. But you need to empower from soup to nuts the ability to have and talk and obsess on those values, because you're right. When the CEO comes up and she says, hey, Dick, you know, why are you doing this? You're right. The, the, the worst answer is I don't know because we're doing it. Right. And, and I, I would say in any leadership position, and this is true, whether you're a security leader, whether you're a finance leader, you're a contracts leader, is, you know, you're taking care of your people. And part of taking care of them is making sure they understand what's going on. So I found that you can't, it's impossible to over communicate. You know, you say it's a little bit like dealing, you know, with people, you got to, sometimes you got to, they don't get it the first three times. They get it the fourth time. No, that's that's great. You know, you make me think of something talking about leaders and and people air quotes here getting it. A lot of times in crisis situations or critical situations, let's back it to that. There's confusion among leaders as to who's making certain decisions. You know, maybe it's office closures, evacuations, something or another. And I think of I'm going to say risk leader and not specifically security leader here, a lot of times, in, in my opinion, in my observation, risk leaders are there to help coordinate C-suite decision making. So what's your observation and what's your tips as a security and risk leader to help enable C-suite decision making process during those critical times? You know, you've been, you've been reading my mind, Chuck. Uh, one of the things... <laughs> is first off understanding what the organization's, shall we say, crisis management, crisis response, bu business continuity policies and procedures are. And most organizations will have some body that has been identified that will have that role. Second thing is understanding what the who has the decision authority for certain things. Who can make a decision to close an office, you know, at, for example. And you want to try to, and if you don't have that decided up front, that's something you need to decide before there's a crisis, because a crisis is 
business that is not normal. Normal procedures often don't pertain in a crisis situation. And so you want to make sure that the organization has crisis response and decision procedures and that those are understood. So as, as a chief security officer, I may not have that authority to close the office. I might be able to make a recommendation, but if it's the chief operating officer who has that authority, people need to understand, everybody needs to understand that, not just the chief operating officer and the chief security officer, but the chief financial officer needs to understand that. The CEO needs to understand it. But it's interesting, though. I think maybe a uh, a uh, a task as a leader, if you come into an organization, you're a security or risk leader. Part of that is to map your map the map the decision makers almost, um, because you might say, "Oh, hey, I need to go talk to the CEO immediately." Maybe she's not the one to talk to. Maybe you need to go talk to her chief of staff, or you need to go talk to legal or whatever. I mean. Do you feel like people make that that mistake like, oh, I need to go see, I need to go to the top right now and have a briefing? Or am I am I thinking about this incorrectly? No, I don't think you're thinking about it incorrectly. And I think it's incredibly important to get the lay, you know, get a, the lay of the land and who's who. And you know, who are the key players? What what are some of the issues? Because what you don't want to do is uh, you know, stumble into a minefield unintentionally. When by, you know, talking to various people, learning, you know, who the key power brokers are, key decision makers are, what are some of the hot button issues that you, you know, it, it, sometimes you have to push a hot button, but you want to do, do it consciously. I much prefer sends of commission than sends of omission. Right. And there's a bit of, uh, I'll say, Kentucky windage in this, too, where because, we're, you know, in an intelligence driven organization, you under you know if we we assume that hey we've gone and we've looked and we understand what the priorities are for the organization we've gone and mapped our key leader and critical decision makers we kind of understand like this is what we're saying publicly here's kind of what we're tracking right now and then you know you start looking at the trends and and I I'm not saying that we're going to be predictive but as our good friend Ross Hill might say we're going to be able to forecast danger areas and say hey look boss by the way, the conditions that happened during the Arab Spring are all happening now. Maybe it's a good time to look at where all of our various business units are placed in the world and you know, do some additional risk assessment or some additional training or something. And how important do you feel the role of forecaster is for a security leader? I, I think it's important, but I think to be effective as a forecaster, there are two things that you need to do. Number one is to gain credibility with the decision makers that you're trying to persuade so that it, you want them to, well, if Dick said this, then it must be true because Dick is telling us, Dick is always very clear about this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and this is what I think. Right. And so when I say, I know this, they go, okay, it must be, must be so. When I when he says I, I think this, and also part of it is educating these leaders and making them, you know, helping them become more what I would call security fluent. Right. Well, it's interesting to me. You're going back to this family table and service that's you know clearly followed you through your whole career of like look, understand the culture, understand the the priorities, understand the value understand their language, but also give them enough so that they can obla the security language as well. And perhaps we'll start meeting in the middle and, and helping drive culture. Right. So, you know, when I was at uh, my last corporate chief security officer assignment was at Booz Allen Hamilton. And uh, I had uh, two different bosses while I was there. And a and my new boss came in, who and she had been with the organization a long time, very experienced, very smart, very savvy person, but she was new to the security business. So we spent a lot of time, and she was very appreciative of the fact that I would try to, you know, explain to her, you know, some of the security rationale behind doing things. And uh, she was a great leader before, and I think maybe she got a little better because she became more fluent with security and that's part of her portfolio. But she was also comfortable in the fact that she said, Hey, I don't know this. Explain to me why you, why you want to do it this way. And, 
as you say, it, it all starts with em embodying trust. So, you know, we've been talking about, I guess what we would say, intelligence driven operations led mantra here. And I'm thinking like there's folks out there listening who maybe are new in role or maybe they're changing into a role or leveling up or, or whatever reason you know, what advice would you tell those folks? And hey, here's here's what you need to embrace in order to have an intelligence-driven work and intelligence-driven risk management approach. I, I think what you have to do is, number one, establish credibility of you as an individual and to follow on to that, your team. And you need to make sure your team understands the importance of gaining credibility with everybody across the uh, firm. There was a, right. there's an expression from a, a book I read when I was a young man uh, by Rudyard Kipling called Kim. And it was a story about intelligence on the Northwest frontier and in, in mm -hmm. the British colonial India. And the hero of the story is a young boy named Kim. And one of his nicknames was, he was known as the little friend of all the world because he tried to make contacts with everybody. And so I would tell people in my organization, you know, I know 20 people within the company. Each of you probably know 20 people within the company. You know, between, between us, we probably know several thousand people in the company. If we can leverage our contacts with the 20 people we know across the security organization, we can do this educate, mentor, develop, partner, because basically what you want people to do is it's, it's like nowadays, most people won't walk out of the house without their cell phone. We want, I think it's important on the security perspective. They look at us like a cell phone. Of course, I wouldn't leave without my cell phone. Right. That's, oh, that's a great way to put it. I want security there all the time. And again, they may not have something to offer, but you know, sometimes you may get a little meeting fatigue, but I'd rather, I'd rather be there. You know, because we have a, we have a value that we can offer regarding security matters. But if we have been doing our homework and learning about the business of the business, we occasionally can offer some thoughts and we can have that family dinner table conversation saying, hey, uh, do you really think this, uh, you know, uh, us getting a contract with this organization is in the best interest overall of the business? Right. Or have you, or have you considered the pricing sc scheme? Because, you know, you've learned a little bit about this and people will sit there and say, oh, you're more than just a security guy. You're more than gates and guards. Right. Well, as you say, like understanding the value, I mean, speaking of Rudyard Kipling's Kim, I mean, his quote doesn't in the book. He says something like there's no sin as great as ignorance. So if you walk into a role, I mean, it's a sin not to know your company. It's a sin not to know your organization. I mean, so I, I, I think that's great. And. Obviously, I, I, I read that book, too, multiple times throughout my military career, uh, both by choice and by force. <laughs> um, that, so a side question real quick on that is like we've talked about gaining credibility multiple times in, in our time here and in, in things. Somebody's probably out there waving their hand or driving right now going, what advice would you have for me to get a quick win? I'm walking in an organization. Is there such a thing as a quick win or is it just be quiet, read the tea leaves and, and uh, try to discern my value and, and be ready? I think it's, I hate to take this cop out that you've heard before. Uh, it, it, you know, it depends. Uh, it's, you know, you need to be prepared for a quick win and keep your eyes and, and head on a swivel. So that you're looking for opportunities to make that that quick win, but also uh, I think former White House Chief of Staff and Chicago Governor Rahm Emanuel once said, uh, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." You know, while you while you don't necessarily want a crisis, you need to kind of be looking at possible emerging crises and see if you can get out ahead of them, or if a crisis does occur. How can you turn that around into an advantage, you know, into an advantage? In other words, uh, perhaps your employee background screening program has some holes in it and you're getting people who have perhaps falsified data on their background, et cetera. And you have a contract that says, you know, your company will provide 10 people with master's degrees and you, you know, it's discovered you only provided eight, uh, 
that's not a good situation to be in, but yeah. situations like that occur and you got to own when, when something like that happens, you can sit there and say, yeah, that's not good. We need to tighten up our background sc- screening, pre-employment background screening program. And here are some thoughts as to how we do it. Yeah. And it's great. And I think the thing about a crisis too, and you know, we, we hope to avoid any crises, but a crisis is also an opportunity as a risk leader to hyperscale your, your internal network. Now, I think the, the challenge, if you will, is once the crisis has been averted or maybe it's died down a bit, you've got a network, you have a responsibility to upkeep it. Don't let it, don't let it trickle out. No, no, no. And, and trying to, de- you know, as you try to prevent the crisis from occurring, one of the things that you want to kind of try to ask and educate people is most companies have a, a crisis management uh, process. Most company, when I like to say a crisis management process is, is what, what you do while the buildings are still shaking in the earthquake. And then you have a, a business continuity where you, you're, the buildings have stopped shaking. How do you get the business back up and running, doing what the business is doing? Part of it is in advance of need, trying to come up with a crisis management plan. In advance of need, come up with a business continuity plan so that the first you know, so that you're not dealing with a situation where all your servers have been taken down because of you know somebody introduced a bug, uh, and now you're trying to figure out how to get back up online. Whereas if you had a plan beforehand, uh, and then come up, have a plan, and then exercise the plan, so that the people know who does what to who. And have you know kind of tested it out because one of the things I like to tell say is that a failure to plan is a plan to fail, but also is a, a plan to fail is having plans that haven't been realistically pressure tested. Yeah, abso- absolutely. It's um, and that's important too because especially if you go through it once, you should never. It should never be a surprise again. Don't create your own gray white rhinos or, or black swans for sure. Dick, I am already looking forward in anticipating another podcast with you where we can talk about what we learned from Marcus Aurelius uh, that can <laughs> infer security leaders. So, uh, Major General Lake, I-, I can't tell you how awesome this has been for me. And thank you so much for your time in, in being on the Ontic Protective Intelligence Podcast. Well, Chuck, thanks for having me. I, I-, I really enjoyed it. This episode was brought to you by the Ontic Center for Protective Intelligence. Learn more at ontic.co slash center. Again, that's ontic.co slash center. It was produced by AJ McKeon. Our music is a track called Monte Verde Ride and was written by Brian Bristow and performed by Smoke and Novas. Check them out on Spotify. Please remember to rate and review our podcasts on iTunes and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions, we'd love to hear them. You can reach us at podcast at ontic.co or visit ontic.co slash center for more information. Thanks for listening.